Good morning, everybody. Is, can you can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. I just want to make sure that someone is there on the other end and we can start the lecture. Can I start? Are you guys ready for this? Are we on talking terms or am I going to be the only one speaking today? You can try to speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was going to be in person, but since uh, because of the Delta variant, we have to do this way. So predominantly, I'm going to try to speak that way. The flow of the lecture will be easy. Uh, towards the end of the talk, if you guys have any questions, you can ask. In the middle, um, occasionally, I might ask, check with you guys, just to make sure that we are all in the same page, OK? So today, uh, we are going to take call together. So on stroke call with the neuroradiologist is the topic of choice. Um, and the learning objectives are to evaluate the imaging findings, to identify the arterial stroke, to recall the brain vascular distributions, to analyze the carotid artery diseases, <clears throat> and to recognize venous stroke. This is the mantra of stroke imaging and treatment, right? Time saved is brain saved. So we're going to do a quick retrieval before we take call. So some of the things to check before we start, starting from the first years all the way um, to the final years, is that what are the imaging studies we're going to do, right? So they are CT, <clears throat> head without contrast, MRI of the brain without contrast, CT angiogram of the head and neck, MRI angiogram of the head and neck, CT perfusion. These are some of the studies that are going to be um, looked into today under brain imaging. So this is a picture, a colored uh, picture of the various vascular distributions. Um, I'm going to see if people can voice out what that yellow stands for, which arterial distribution is that. ACA. 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 How about the orange or reddish orange looking one? This? MCA. MCA. How about this? PCA. Okay, so how about this one? What feeds the region of the basal ganglia? So you have a couple. These come off the M1 segment, the middle cerebral arteries. So which one would it be? So this is the medial and this is the lateral lenticular stripe branches, okay? And this would be the region of the anterior choroidal distribution. So here it's color coded and you guys were right. So just remember, remember the medial lenticular stride, lateral lenticular stride arteries and the anterior choroidal. <clears throat> so CT perfusion is going to be predominantly what we're going to discuss because in the prior talks we have touched most of the others. So in CT perfusion, the most important thing is the cerebral blood flow is equal to cerebral blood volume by mean transit time. So what is cerebral blood flow? It is a volume of blood passing through a given amount of brain tissue per unit of time. So it's going to be mo per minute per 100 grams of tissue. The cerebral blood volume is the volume of blood per a given volume of brain. So just mo per 100 gram of brain tissue. Mean transit time is the average time for blood transiting through the given brain region in any particular time. So it's going to be in seconds. And it is always, I want you guys to note that it is at a microvascular level, okay, mean transit time. The time to peak is a time from contrast arrival to the time of maximal tissue concentration. So these are the parameters we'll be keeping on checking. And what is Tmax? It is a time at which the maximum value of the residue function occurs after deconvolution. Okay, so in regular terms, it means it's a combination of delay, dispersion, and to a lesser degree, even the mean transit time. It talks about the, the way the contrast distributes. 
So the time to peak and the Tmax are largely affected by contrast delay from indirect macrovascular pathways of contrast delivery. So this one is macrovascular, whereas when we talked about mean transit time, MTT, we were talking about a microvascular level. So the Tmax does include MTT also within it to a lesser extent. The CT perfusion parameters, the normal ones are, in the gray matter, approximately, you know, these are the numbers that I remember. Four for fluid, 60. For cerebral vol blood volume, it's again another four. Whereas in white matter, you know, the time is almost the same, just a little change. It's 4.8. Whereas when you look at flow from 60, this is 25, you know, less than half. And cerebral blood volume from four, it drops to two. It's almost half. So even in a normal perfusion parameter, when you look, there is going to be difference in cerebral blood flow and volume by half between the two. So when there is a perfusion defect, it, the difference has to be even more than that. However, when you look at mean transit time, they're almost close to each other. So even if there's any small um, decrease in anywhere of any area of the brain, then you can tell, oh, okay, there's a perfusion defect there. So the time-based parameters really help. Infarct, what is it? The core has already infarcted or is destined to infarct regardless of therapy, which means you have a prolonged mean transit time or Tmax and a markedly decreased cerebral blood flow and decreased volume. Penumbra is a tissue at risk and it can be salvaged, which is where you guys come in, right? And for you, you need to know these prolonged mean transit time decreased flow, but normal or even increased volume. So basically, if you quickly look at the volume, it's a safer parameter when you eyeball the scan to say if it is infarcted already or it if, if it is in the region of the penumbra. So the basic concept goes this way. Main transit time is increased. And if the time to peak is increased, then check these two. Cerebral blood flow usually is decreased, but the volume Okay, this thing is in my way. If the volume is also decreased, you can see, right? Because red is increased, blue is decreased. So you can see how the whole thing is decreased. If it's decreased, it's going to be an infarct. Whereas increase in mean transit time and TTP, whereas decreased cerebral blood flow, all these are the same. However, when the cerebral blood volume is normal, or if it's increased, for example, in this, in this study, you can see how it's increased, meaning red, you can always check the map colors, okay? This is usually what we use, however, the colors can change, so don't get thrown off. Always check your um, scale in the corner of the image. So here you can see how even the flow is hard to tell, but when this looks thinner and this looks thicker, so probably there's an area of decreased flow, but definitely when you look at cerebral blood volume, this side doesn't look any different from this, so you'll have to think about, uh, okay, fine, this tissue at risk, there's a penumbra, so we need to act fast. Now, RAPIDS is the neurologist's best friend, isn't it? So it's FDA approved. The radiologist, some of us use it, we look at it, but we let you guys interpret it. Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the things that you might want to quickly check. Uh, how do we do this? So we give a 40 ml bolus contrast injection and 60 to 70 second CT scan of eight centimeter brain tissue is scanned, predominantly in the anterior circulation. The scan cycles every one to three seconds and it captures the entire passage of contrast through the brain. Then the data is sent to rapid and the computer automated system creates the curves for all the pixels within the coverage region as the bolus travels from the arteries through the parenchymal tissue and throughout the system. Every time I try to remove this, I'm having difficulty. So the rapids will calculate your cerebral blood volume, the flow, the MTT, and your Tmax. Important things that you guys have to check is AIF and DOF, which is the arterial input function and the venous outflow function. They have to look as nice, sharp, single peaks. It has to be more than 100 Hounsfield units on your y-axis. Then you know what the information that you got is actually good information based on which you can interpret the study. Um, the computer by itself um, changes the various corrections to noise, uh, to signal regularization, oscillatory artifact, 
hematocrit differences between the large vessels and capillaries, everything the machine itself does. Um, but if you want to make any specific changes, it's predominantly using the venous outflow function, particularly because the dural sinuses are larger, whereas the main artery are smaller. So if any change has to be made, it's easy to make on the venous side. And when we're reading it, there are times that we could be misled. So there will be the pitfalls. What is all the pitfalls? When you're looking at the study, that is the cerebral blood flow of less than 30% in the Tmax when they calculated for more than six seconds. If you start seeing bilateral defects, if the patient really has bilateral defects on your MR, then that's a different thing. But if it is just supposed to be on one end, but your rapids are showing both sides, beware. It could be a pitfall. You may or may not want to really pay attention to that. Um, the arterial inflow curve, usually we remember we said 100 Hounsfield unit. It, if it is less than 80, then it means that there is a smaller contrast bolus, so it may not be reliable. The low attenuation bolus often could be identified on Tmax greater than six second maps as a large defect, so watch out for those. Absence of deficit on cerebral blood flow less than 30%, even when there is a known core infarct on non-enhanced CT, is secondary to how the algorithm threshold for displaying the core infarct has been placed. So for example, there are um, like the CSF and extra parenchymal tissue we don't care about. So the threshold is set above it. Same way if the infarct area just happens to fall below the threshold, it's not going to pick it. And the cerebral, um, when you look at the perfusion maps, if there is reperfusion of infarcted tissue, the map may not pick it. So these we'll have to keep in mind while we're reading the rapids. I saw a lot of articles, some of these articles in Stroke Journal, and even one in Practical Neurology I thought was uh, simple, and you guys can have a quick look at it. So now the call is ready. We did look at the basics, so we should be able to address. 72-year-old female with acute onset of right facial droop. Patient has a history of colon cancer with lung meds and AFib. They get a CT head. As I look at the CT head, I really don't see any difference between the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. Gravid matter looks preserved. The ventricles look all right. But when I look at these, can someone tell me what they're seeing? This is the DWI sequence. This is the ADC sequence. And I can see increased DWI in the left MCA distribution. It's in the region of the operculum and decreased ADC here. So we are looking at, can you give me a shout out? Can tell, someone tell me what it is? Acute stroke. Acute stroke. Acute stroke. Acute stroke. Uh, which distribution? MCA. MCA. And the next thing, as a neurologist, what do you want to know? Right. Then you'll ask me this particular question and I would answer it. And that's based on the gradient sequence. So what is this? Is there blood or not, right? So does this patient have blood? No. No. So it's a non-hemorrhagic acute infarct. And then you would say, Dr. Ram, you totally forgot about the MRA that I ordered. And then I'd be like, okay. So in this region, we already know we are looking at the left MCA distribution. See that? Sometimes when the vessel splits, it does get thinner. Sometimes the vessel just gets narrowed and stenosed and it gets smaller. When I'm already looking at an infarct in that region, then I'm going to say, okay, it got smaller, it looks stenosed. It's not completely occluded, but that probably is the reason. And then we always check the CTA part and here the internal carotid arteries. This is just for normal anatomy. They look wide and widely patent, the bowel part. So in two days when you guys got a follow-up, you guys did a fantastic job. There's no hemorrhage. But you can see how 
the stroke on my first CT image, we couldn't see anything, but now it's beginning to evolve and I can see a hypodensity there. So this is a left MCA non-hemorrhagic stroke in evolution, right? It's evolving. This is a 47-year-old female with acute onset left-sided weakness post-motorcycle crash. Can anyone tell me if they are seeing something here? Loss of gray-white differentiation on the right side, on the right. Great. So it's in the right cerebral hemisphere. Almost most of it that you're seeing here, right? But most of it is going to be in the temporal frontal lobes. So you get the MR, and what he said is what we see here. So it's hyper-intense DWI signal in the right MCA distribution with hypo-intense ADC. So that's restricted diffusion. And this time, we definitely do see changes in the flare signal that is hyper-intense signal. So it's not hyperacute. It's already beginning to get to the acute stage. And in the gradient sequence, you can see hypointense signal areas, which means there's hemorrhage in that region. And when we look at the MRA, I think this might be a CTA because you can see pieces of bone. You can see when compared to the left side that the right MCA here looks like it's almost cut off. I do see some flow here, which could be easily collateral flow, right? So this one is a right MCA occlusion, and then they think, okay, we need to get the neurointerventionalist involved. At the same time, we have a CT perfusion on this patient. So the first thing that I do is I look for the venous outflow, arterial inflow. How do I know what it means? Check here. So the red is for artery, green is for vein, and this is called the graph. So a lot of things is on the image. That's why I put all these other parameters that you guys can see. So if you are starting, then you know what you're looking at. And the next thing is blood flow. Because a lot of times, all these are colored this in the same scale. So make sure you look in the corner to see what you're looking at. So we already know that there is a right MCA distribution in infarct, acute infarct. When you look at this, the blood flow is really decreased because blue in the scale is decreased. And when you look at the blood volume, some of that region here is not as much decreased as this. So there is a, this large area of infarct because you have decreased flow and decreased volume, but also some of this shows some discrepancy between the two and we have a penumbra. And mean transit time, like we expected, is overall significantly increased. And you'll have to check the arterial and the venous uh, locations. So if you can see, they have marked the artery here. And you can see it is in the region of the left ICA terminus. And I'm looking for the venous outflow. A lot of times it is in the sinus, particularly along the posterior region. It's either in the posterior superior um, sagittal sinus, or it can be in the region of the torcula where the vein is nice and prominent. So there is less volume averaging. It looks like the big great locations and when you look at the bolus timing it looks great but even here you can tell how you can see flow in the left and then you don't see flow in the right and look at these these are really nice peaks single they are tall they are narrow this is one of the best studies that it has picked which means i can really pay attention to all the parameters that i see in my rapid right and this is going to be true so we already looked you see the cerebral blood flow, and usually they calculate less than 30% over six seconds. It gives you the mismatch. So then once I know everything is what I should be trusting and there's no uh, error, then the rest of it, you guys know how to handle this. Hypoperfusion index is given. And it always tells what it is. You know, it's a blood flow map or it's a volume. Um, and the indexes are calculated because it's all computer generated. And then this is a pretty picture, you know, where you can see the CT image, the whole perfusion one, then you can see the volume, you can see the flow, the mean transit time, and Tmax at any, any level quickly. If you want to scan, this would be a great image. And here you can see how you can see the difference right there and right there. And this was a right MCA hemorrhagic infarct with penumbra.
So the next patient comes in. Of course, neurology residents are always busy in stroke. 54-year-old female with altered mental status. In this patient, anyone wants to take this one? Left ACA stroke. Left ACA. Do you want to call it acute, subacute, or chronic? What do you think it is? Maybe acute. Acute. Why am I saying it's acute? If this is DWI increased and ADC decreased, then there has to be a restricted diffusion, right? And you can start seeing increased T2 signal even in acute stages. So we are going to call it acute. Next thing is we are checking the perfusion. And I see nice peaks. And you can check the AIF and the VOF. They all look really nice. So I'm looking at the mean transit time. I do this for all my perfusion studies anyway. You know, if we get the rapids, then you guys are going to double check for sure. A lot of times based on this, we are able to tell. The mean transit time is increased in the left ACA distribution where we already saw the stroke. The max is also increased. But when you look at the cerebral blood flow and the volume, when you compare to the other side, it does not look like there's much of a change. So I'm going to say, it's probably getting ready to start um, showing those changes in this is a larger area of penumbra. 54-year-old female with visual changes. Which distribution is this one? Right PCA? Right PCA. Great. So it's an acute right PCA distribution infer. I was just trying to cover some areas of distribution. So this one, anyone wants to take a shot at this one? What is a geographic distribution? And then we can check on which artery it could be, or arteries. Internal medial arteries. So that's medial palami bilaterally, right? This would be my posterior limb. I get the thalamus, and most of it is going to be the thalamus because right here is where my basal ganglia is. So in the thalamus, when I see the artery, there's one artery specifically which arises from the posterior cerebral artery and it tends to supply both the thalami. And tell, anyone tell me the name of that vessel? Have you come across that? Artery of Pechron. Yeah. Artery of Pechron. Awesome. So, you know, when you see bilaterally people, we normally tend to think, oh, it's going to be two, two sides, two vessels. But this artery of Pechron, not everybody has it, but when you have it, this is how it looks like. So this is an artery of Pechron acute infarct. So this image, one of the senior residents, or anybody for that matter, can you tell me what is wrong with this picture? What is abnormality in the CT angiogram study? This is like an eye test. And you can get there, it. There's no filling on the right MCA. So I can see why you would say that, because here you can see that and you do not. But if you see, the head is tilted, and this is kind of in the MCA distribution, like meaning cilian fissure. That is here, the head is a little tilted, so I don't see the cilian fissure. I, I can see why you're thinking what you're thinking. That's great. But then this is how you say, okay, maybe the head is tilted, so I don't see that one. But is there anything else? And in the boards, when they give you a CT image or an MR image, they are focusing on the abnormality very well, right? And once you pick it's an arterial study, then definitely focus on your artery or your veins to come up with the diagnosis for your exam. So what is this structure?
which vessel runs there? So uh, this is part of the brainstem, that much we can tell. The reason I have windowed it where you cannot see the gray Y junction very well is because I wanted to bring out the difference between the vessels, the way they were enhancing. So if this is part of the brainstem, what is the major artery that runs anterior to it, supplying? Basilary. Basilar artery. So when you see the contrast enhancement in the ICA, you see it in the MCA, but here it's not as good. So that should raise a red flag. So I'm thinking, oh, something is going on at the basilar artery. It's not, it's not like totally disappeared, but it seems to have some kind of density within it. However, it's not fully enhancing. And then you get the other images to confirm. So if you don't really look, you might end up missing these things. How the vessel enhances up to this. But this, I have to give it to you guys. This part is not stenosed. Like this part is not stenosed. It's just the way the vessel is turning. And I'm able to say that only because I'm going from, you know, in a coronal image, I'm going front to back. In a sagittal, I'm going side to side. That's the only reason I know that. But on this image, coming back to the topic that we were discussing, the basal artery, the distal portion, including the tip, you see that there is decreased contrast enhancement. So this patient has a thrombus there. The vessel is not narrowed, it's not really stenosis, but something is still inside it. So this would be a basal artery thrombosis with artery of Percheron stroke. So once you have thrombus, it's going to start throwing the emboli. The next patient is a 47-year-old male with no movement in the right upper extremity and right lower extremity, and the patient is aphasic. By the way, I picked all of these studies um, from our hospital. So many of you could have seen many of these patients. They are all real patients. So this is the first image that we got, and it looks like a normal CT head. I will give it to you. And then we got the MR, and we see these kind of, now I think all of us are comfortable with calling this as restricted diffusion, right? So it's hyperintense on DWI, hypointense on ADC. We're going to call it restricted diffusion. It is in the region of the anterior aspect of the left frontal operculum region on the right frontal lobe. This one is a lot more along the posterior aspect. It's in the region of the parietal lobe. This should remind you of infarcts in the region of the watershed between the ACA and the MCA and MCA and PCA. However, can it all be portions of just the left MCA? Sure. Those are the things that are running through my head. And naturally, I go take a quick look at my DWI sequence, and it looks clean. So there's no hemorrhage. And I check my CTA and of the head and neck, and this is what I see, right? See that? So the vessel looks nice and normal, and then you start seeing this filling defect. It is long, it's tubular. It is not completely occluding the vessel. It's a partially um, occluding thrombus in the left common carotid artery. And that started throwing emboli, and that which went into the left ICA distribution ended up with those watershed infarcts. It should be left CCA thrombus with watershed acute infarcts, because that's what I showed you, but yes, it went up. This is just randomly, we're going to look at this, these images. So this is a DWI and this is the ADC. What are we seeing here? So usually we did talk about how you have increased DWI signal and decreased ADC signal to call it restricted diffusion and acute infarct. Hyperacute. When it is reversed. So even in hyperacute early and late hyperacute, which is a few hours and a little more than six hours, you still have true restricted diffusion. But the question here is, is it true restricted diffusion? So where it is dark, this one is bright. So remember, this is DWI and this is ADC. So this is not restricted diffusion. So this looks like it's increased, but then it's not really decreased here. So if you don't see the true complementary decreased ADC with increased DWI, it is not acute stroke. And when it looks like it's mixed, where you do see some increased DWI, but without decreased ADC, the most logical explanation to that is it's going to have T2 shine through, which means increased T2 signal just shined through 
to the DWI, but it is not true restricted diffusion. And this patient ended up having decreased gradient signal. So basically it is, something is happening there. It looks like it's in the left MCA distribution or even left ICA because portions of the ACA is also involved, but it did, does not really cause any significant mass effect or anything. This would be, and look at all the cells, they do look still prominent. Um, this is an old stroke. So be careful when you look at it. If you do not see restricted, true restricted diffusion, it's not acute. That one is an old stroke with hemosiderin deposition. But this is regarding the CTA, it's a similar case, okay? So this is an eye test. Do you see the abnormality? I am in the neck and I can see a vessel with a branch in the neck, a major artery is usually an external carotid artery because internal carotid artery does not have branches. And I see both of them on the left side, but I don't see on the right side, correct? So if I start seeing, I do see something like a filling defect or something that's not enhancing, but still bulbous in the region of the right carotid sheath. So that would be the abnormality. And if you want to double check, then this is where it is on the sagittal plane. So you can see a tubular structure, which is this time completely occluded. And it has a thrombus within it, complete occlusion of the right ICA. And on the other side, you can either be CCA or it can be ICA. The reason is you can have a high or a lower split of the bifurcation. So this is the next patient, 79 year old female with acute onset of left hemiparesis, left gaze paralysis and dysphagia. She stopped anticoagulation for colonoscopy but resumed it in three days. This was the pertinent history. This is what we see. So when compared to the right, yeah, I do see mild decrease in hypodensity is it real? Is it not real? Something for me to consider, right? Sometimes I can have some volume, volume averaging of CSF, but a lot of times when I start seeing loss of gray white junction, then I'm wary. And in this person, I am worried about the right MCA, but I'm looking at the entire, this is a CT angiogram, right? Because I can see enhancing vessels. I do see that abnormality. See that focal filling defect within the right M1 segment. It's not totally occluding the vessel, but it is present. You can see the same thing in the reconstruction. So it is a right M1 segment focal shot segment involvement by a thrombus, but it did not occlude. So I am looking at the graph. I'm not liking this very much, right? Look at the arterial inflow. Look at the venous outflow, it looks fine. But when I'm looking at it, I did realize in the previous CT that these are the areas that I was concerned about, right? This is not the rapid. It's the one that normally the radiologists preferentially look at. So when I look at these, I told you guys, you know, checkups up here so you can tell what kind of parameter we're checking. So in the mean transit time, you can see the increase uh, mean transit time in the region that we were concerned. Whereas the blood flow, it's decreased and in blood volume, it is not as much decreased. So I'm thinking, okay, there is a region of penumbra that can be uh, treated, but I am completely clear that it may not be the best study. However, let me take a quick look at the rapids. Look at the rapids, zero. If you follow this, it can totally take you elsewhere in your diagnosis. So keep things in perspective, okay? Check your graphs, make sure everything is fine. You can still see some amount of change, right, in the arterial peak, but it is not really a peak, so watch out for this. And then sometimes you can even get these, the processing fail. This is much easier because it failed, okay, nobody's going to make a mistake. But when they give it to you and you didn't check the peak and everything looks the way it did because you cannot see any difference, it does not mean that something is not happening. So this is very important for you to do and check because you guys are really busy, you're taking a quick look, and 
you just hone in on the rapids. Watch out for those CT perfusion challenges that you may have to face. In this person, he had bilateral MCA strokes, but on the right side is where the penumbra was, and the patient did have left-sided abnormalities, so we'll have to favor towards that, think of a penumbra, and start treating the patient. So what is the takeaway? This is all you needed to know what we talked in the first 30 minutes, right? So can everyone see this clearly? This is your circular villus, okay? So this would be your internal carotid artery, and this would be your M1 segment, right? And that gives the right MCA, M1 distribution stroke. Along the anterior aspect, you have the M2 superior division. Along the posterior aspect, you have the M2 inferior division. And, and then, remember we talked about the artery of Percheron? See how it comes from the P1 segment right here? And it gets both the thalami. This is the basilar artery. So you have the posterior cerebral arteries. The next one that comes off of it is the superior cerebellar artery. And that gives the superior most aspect of the cerebellum. From the, pont the basilar artery, you have the pontine perforators. So it naturally gets the pontine, the pons. The next vessel would be your AICA. And that should get in the region of the right middle cerebellar pedicle and the adjacent regions. And the pica comes off the vertebral artery. And that gets the inferior portion of the cerebellar hemisphere, and it does get the medulla. These two vessels join to form the anterior spinal artery. Watch out for the cord. And the other branches that we didn't talk so far would be your ACA, right, along the superior aspect of the brain, superior frontal gyrus, and nearby regions. This is the artery of the artery of Hubner. It gets immediately adjacent to the ventricle part of the caudate, the ICA, internal cerebral, uh, internal carotid artery, gets most of the cerebral hemisphere. Then the lateral lenticular stride, we talked about the lateral and the medial lenticular stride. The anterior choroidal, we talked about that also in the very first image. Then you see the pica along the occipital lobe. We talked about the rest. So this one image is all you need to burn in your head. So when you see something quickly, you can come to Okay, this is what's happening. And then you target those in all your other images in your sagittal coronal and make sure that you are right. 46-year-old female came to the hospital with the worst headache. And this is what we saw. Due to time, I'm just going to go over it. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage because it's in the subarachnoid space. It has hyperdensity in the cisterns. It's anterior to the prepontine cistern. And the CTA demonstrated this is probably going to be an MRA because I don't see much of the bone uh, clipping. Sometimes, no matter how much they clip, you can see a little bit of bone. So in the MRA image, you can see the aneurysm that is on the right side of the vasor artery, close to the vertebral basal junction. They went ahead and coiled it. And here you don't see the aneurysm anymore because it's probably coiled and narrowed. Usually you see streak artifact on a CT. And you start seeing hemorrhages. The subarachnoid hemorrhage is still there. There's still uh, edema in the brain. You don't see the salsa and the um, fissure as well. So what happens when you have subarachnoid hemorrhage? You start seeing new infarcts as you get your follow-up study. So there is a new hypodensity that is developing, which was not there before. And when you start seeing the vessels, you know, initially we, we saw normal vessel. The only thing we saw was that aneurysm. But now when you start seeing, see how they are more ratty? Irregular narrowing along the course of the vessel. And this would be the distribution of the MCA. But when you look at the ACA, you can hardly even see it. It's really, really narrowed in bilateral A1 segments. But in this image, it's hard to see the A2. So you can see narrowing in multiple vessels, which is relatively new, it just developed because we already have a normal looking study before, except for that aneurysm. See here, you can see the streak artifact from the coiled aneurysm and you can see the catheter in the ventricle. But if you exclude all that, see how you can see multiple rat bite narrowing. When you see this, then of course, what are we thinking? We can continue to think while we look at the CT perfusion. 
So when you look at the CT perfusion, the mean transit time is increased. And when you look at the cerebral blood flow, you can see how it's beginning to really start decreasing, whereas the volume itself hasn't decreased much. So it's not totally infarcted, but there are large areas of penumbra with ischemia is starting to happen, right? And that is vasospasm. I was going to show you guys the uh, graph, and the graph is a great graph, so I know what I'm seeing was correct data. So this is vasospasm, so remember that. We mainly touched about the major arteries, and then we talked about the vasospasm, but you can get ischemia from many reasons, the carotid artery diseases, that is predominantly atherosclerosis, we saw vasospasm, vasculitis looks like the same thing, but it's not because of subarachnoid hemorrhage, but the vessels themselves are narrowed. And then you have the reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, moya moya, FMD or fibromuscular dysplasia, dissection, which can cause ischemia and the stroke, pseudoaneurysms, they can throw off emboli, and there is keratidynia, takayasu arthritis. So there are many things that the carotid arteries can have which can end up in an ischemic insult. So we are going to go quickly over some of these cases. These are restricted diffusion areas that this is a flare sequence, which is situated, and this is DWI increase. It is in the region of the posterior aspect and bilateral occipital lobes, almost like how you would see in a press, right? Posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, similarly. But when you look at the vessels, press is related to hypertension, right? Uncontrolled hypertension. Whereas in this, you will actually see multiple vessels with multiple narrowings. It's there involving, this is the basilar artery, right? You can check that. So you can see it in bilateral posterior cerebral arteries. These are the vertebral arteries which are showing varying degrees of narrowing. That one is reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. It's also called Carl Fleming syndrome. It's multiple cerebral artery vasoconstrictions basically, and they can cause acute and recurrent headaches. It's caused because of a transient disturbance in the control of the cerebral vascular tone. It causes vasoconstriction, subsequently ischemia, stroke, and death. It's associated with press. It can occur in one third of the cases spontaneously. It's precipitated by postpartum vasoactive substances, autoimmune diseases, immunosuppressive therapy. So it's something to keep in mind. How do you really tell it? DSA, which, which is digital subtraction angiography, 100% sensitive. Um, it involves large and medium-sized arteries. It will be multifocal, diffuse, segmental narrowing. It gives a string of beads and sausage appearance. You know, you saw this narrowing, then a little dilatation kind of an appearance. A lot of times the non-enhanced CT doesn't even show anything. Sometimes you can see hemorrhages like subarachnoid hemorrhage, apparent canal hemorrhage. CT and MRA may also be normal. Subtle changes you may be able to see. Um, and if you see, you'll see varying areas of constriction. So that is reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Now, this patient has encephalomalacic changes along bifrontal lobes. And when you look at the MRA, this is the internal cerebral artery. It just stops. I don't see the expected ACA. I don't see the MCA. Instead, I see this vague signal change. And this is the posterior circulation. It looks normal. And when you look at the image itself, you can see some of these prominent increased signal, which would be the collaterals of the lenticular stride arteries. And then you see the significant narrowing. I'm going to show you another case in a child where it's really well seen. See how you can see the vessel itself is not seen, but you can see a lot of flow voids. And it's extending internally and posteriorly because it's much more florid. And you can see the lenticular stride um, arteries, they can enhance. This patient also has other findings, okay? But we're focusing right now here. And this is how the DSA looks like. You can see the internal carotid artery is being catheterized, and you can see the flow, but you do not see the expected ACA, MCA, the, the split that happens. Instead, you are seeing a lot of these collaterals. Do you guys know what this disease entity is? Moya, moya, okay? So in the ICA, 
is narrowed progressively and then it completely gets occluded and there's secondary collateralization. It can be primary, it's most commonly in Japan and in Korea. The moya moya just means puff of smoke. Okay, that's why they call it the moya moya disease. It has bimodal representation. It can be associated with syndromes like an F1. This is a different patient. And here you see a cockscrew appearance or a beaded appearance. It involves the internal carotid artery because it goes like this and it goes like this. It goes in and out, so you didn't see this part of the artery. It was patent. So when I see this, the diagnosis is fibromuscular dysplasia. So a few words about FMD. It gives a spring of bead appearance. It's idiopathic, non-inflammatory, non-atherosclerotic angiopathy. Involves a small and medium arteries, usually in young females. It can involve any part of the wall, which is the intima media or the adventitia, most commonly the media. It weakens the wall and predisposes to dissection. Okay, this is another patient. Here in the region of the internal carotid artery, normally you should just have a flow void. Instead of a flow void, you also see hyper intense signal. And this sequence would be a T1 sequence because the CSF is dark. So when I start seeing difference in signal within the vessel, then it's time to get an MRA or a CTA, right? And this is what I got in an MRA. So here, in one side, you really get uniform flowing artery with similar signal, but here you do see differential signal. So that which is hyper usually is associated with flow in the true lumen, and this would be the false lumen. So when you have two lumens, then the diagnosis is going to be dissection. So dissection, you can see in a regular MRI brain. Check your T1 sequences. And this is, anyone wants to take a shot at this one? But the vessel is enlarged and it has enhancing component where there's flow. And then there are parts that's not enhancing as much. So what is an, uh, an enlarged vessel called? It's an aneurysm, right? But if it's associated with dissection, then you call it a pseudoaneurysm. So this one, I'm not sure how often we see it. I don't see it in my usual regular practice until it's, you know, we are looking at it in textbooks and stuff. This is a post-contrast study, right? And you can see that the wall is thickened and it is enhancing. This is a acute condition called carotidinia. Few words about that. It's a conferential uniform enhancing tissue. In this case, it was around the distal CCA. Intimal involvement is often seen and that's enhancing. Patient has tenderness. Treatment is steroids. You give steroids in 10 days or two weeks. Patient actually gets cured. It resolves. This is another entity involving the vessels. Here you can see the aortic arch and its wall looks thickened, right? And then the vessels coming off of it, the first vessel will be the innominate artery or the brachycephalic. And the next one will be the left common, then the left subclavian. You can see how all their walls are thickened. And then as you keep going even more superiorly, you can see how they continue to course, but you can see their wall thickened. And you start seeing thickening of these major arterial walls, then naturally it causes narrowing of this vessel with multiple stenosis. And this one, sorry about this, this is Takayasu arteritis. Pulseless disease. It's a granulomatous large vessel vasculitis. It involves aorta and its branches more so, much more so than the pulmonary arteries. You have a pre pulseless face with non-specific symptoms, and then you have a pulseless face. A lot of times it's limb ischemia and renal vascular hypertension when it involves the renal arteries. It's smooth circumferential. It can be eccentric wall thickening, and it has stenosis, thrombosis, aneurysms. So that is Takayasu's arthritis. This patient is a 23-year-old male with headache and papilledema. And they were wondering if there was intracranial hypertension. And they said, hmm, maybe we need to check for sinus thrombosis. And they ended up getting a CT venogram and an MR venogram. So 
when I'm looking at an MR being, this would be the superior sagittal sinus, left transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, internal jugular vein. I do see a gap here. And I'm going to give it to you guys. It's the way it was bending. And when I rotated the image even more, I was able to see the whole of it. But all this is missing. So the whole right transverse sinus is not seen. And I do see some moment of flow in the region of the sigmoid sinus and in the internal jugular vein. So that is really worrisome for right transverse sinus occlusion, right? It can be hypoplastic. That's something that we need to think about. Um, but when the vessel is occluded, the best thing, how would I know? Then I'm looking for a large tubular filling defect within the vessel, and I'm able to see it on a CT venogram better, but in the coronal similar image, I can see the left transverse sinus, but I cannot see the right transverse sinus. And when I see those kind of things, that leads to venous infarcts. This particular patient did not have a venous infarct, but I'm going to show you one which did. It's a hemorrhagic stroke. It's in the non-arterial distribution. It's near dural sinuses. In the non-enhanced CT, you can see a dense vein sign can have a cord sign. So the thrombus has increased Hounsfield units, right? So it's going to look dense. In a contrast enhanced study, it's going to look like a filling defect. So if it's a superior sagittal sinus, it looks like a delta, and the thrombus takes the shape of the vessel, it looks like an empty delta sign. Differential to consider would be arachnoid granulation. When you see nice round oval filling defects, think about arachnoid granulation. And of course, thrombus can also look like nice and oval instead of always tubular. Then the difference would be on a non-enhanced CT, arachnoid granulation usually follows CSF signal. That is, when it is thrombus, it has higher Hounsfield unit. Okay, watch out for those. And then high hematocrit levels, meaning if you have polycythemia and those kind of diseases, normally the blood itself is dense. So it can look like a dense vein sign, but just make sure you cannot have a dense vein throughout all the sinuses, right? So it could be something relating to a high hematocrit level that we need to be thinking about. So this is the one that I was talking about. This is how the normal area looks like. You can see maybe part of the transverse sinus and then the sigmoid sinus, but definitely here there is a hyperdensity, asymmetrical. So I know it's not something like polycythemia. Um, and next to it, definitely gives it away. So I do see hyperdensity, which looks like hemorrhage, and there is edema in this region. So this would be a hemorrhagic lesion in a setting of a thrombus in a dural sinus. Definitely this is going to be a hemorrhagic venous infarct, right? So in one image, actually, you can actually make the diagnosis. And that was a non-enhanced CT. And this one would be your empty delta sign because it looks like a delta superior sagittal sinus and it has a filling defect within it that would be superior sagittal sinus thrombosis so that was venous infarct so you guys still with me yes we are awesome so we are going to retrieve right because the minute i leave and you leave we get into our worlds and sometimes we forget so I'm not going to ask about all those later part, the diseases that I showed in the later and I talked about. Most of them is something that you need to remember because we keep seeing all the time that atherosclerotic disease and the infarcts. But definitely pay attention to others. When I'm looking at my CT as a neuroradiologist, I'm looking for all of these and much more. Other vague things that I didn't talk about would be like, you know, I have seen cancer eroding into the artery. So it would be oncology asking me to do the CTA, but then it would end up in a stroke, so you guys will be involved. You can have fat emboli related infarcts. Um, you can have post-radiation causing uh, nearing of the vessel causing infarcts. So there are many scenarios that we think about when we are thinking of stroke. So I'm going to pick a zone and I'm going to ask and you're going to help me with the diagnosis. Okay, so what is this? Can anyone tell me which distribution? Definitely it's acute infarct, thanks to Jeremy Hyde. It's an ASNR. I took this picture from ASNR. Um, if you guys need it, I can always send it to Lilia. 
but can someone tell me which area of infrared that one is? Okay, how about this one? Can you guys see the image? Yeah, um, right MCA. Awesome, yeah. so right MCA. You guys actually should not even be thinking that much. I gave you the circle over this, right? So if you know which artery this is, then you know that infarct is from that artery. You just have to name that artery, right? It's the pica. Um, let me look at acupuncture real quick. <laughs> so it is the pica, right? So okay. what happens, tell me about the vertebral artery. So what is the syndrome associated with pica that you guys get excited about? Well, I'm right. Okay. So now that I gave away, you're not only looking at the MRI, but you're also looking at the circular villus. So quickly, you can always check. But I want you guys to remember this. That's why I'm asking you. What is this one? Inferior division, right? Yeah. MCA, perfect. So this would be your M2, right? M2 has a superior and an inferior. Yes. And then this one. Okay. Uh, SCA. I don't know about Brian. Right, SCA. That would be a superior cerebral artery. And if, if, they, if they've been working with that patient, then... Artery of Percheron. Okay. Right. Artery of Percheron. Yes, this one awesome. is the okay. easiest. Basilar. The basilar artery, but what I'm is it? Is basilar, all these are basilar branch, branches, right? This is specific. And it be, the name is also based on the location. What is the geographic anatomical location there? Point, uh, uh, pontine perforators. No. No. perforators. No. Awesome. And which is this one? ICA. ICA. This yeah. one? So, ACA. These are a little bit different, right? Those smaller vessels. Hubner. Artery of Hubner. How about this one? And lenticular stride, like anterior. Um, middle. The lenticular stride would be medial and lateral. Okay. Yeah. So this one is lateral, but as long as you say lenticular stride, I'm very happy. How about this one? Anterior choroidal. This mm -hmm. piece here. This one is PCA. This one would be? Anterior choroidal. Anterior choroidal. How about this one? Uh, Aika. Aika, right. Anterior inferior cerebral artery. And the last one, this one? Now I'm at the base Basilar of the cushion. This one is actually in the cervical medullary junction going into the cord. Anterior spinal. Anterior spinal. Oh, if not, we'll have to do the whole talk again, and I didn't want you guys to sit through that. Awesome. So I think we did a good job. So now you guys are going to tell me, I think we're coming to the end of the talk. I have two minutes. In two minutes, you're going to say what exactly you're taking away with you from this lecture. Something that you did not know, but you learned. Because one part of it is retrieval, and since there is from the first wave, and I don't know if medical students are also there. So we started off with just how to diagnose an acute stroke, and then we went all the way to Moya Moya and all those weird diseases. So I want everybody, you know, whoever can pitch in, what is one thing that you're taking away with you after this lecture? How to read CTPs. Okay. Other voices? Uh, oh, you can say two. Um, how to identify arterial distribution based on imaging. Okay. Venous and parts, RCVS. Awesome. So we touched most of our objectives. Agreed? Yes. So now you guys have to remember it. And when you see me next time, you're going to say, oh, Dr. Ram, I think I saw this stroke here. Or you'll be like, oh, Dr. Ram, you were so busy reading. And you know what? You missed this one millimeter thrombus here. Can you take a look at it for me? 
And I would be like, oh my God, you guys are awesome. Right? Our okay. show is over. <laughs> and you know, it's over, we are like, oh my God, I'm done. So you guys go and have a great day. Until we meet again, thank you. I love always being with you guys. Anything? Thank you, Dr. Ram. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ramel. Any, any, anybody has any questions? That's a good sign. I think I'm done here. So don't, thank you. Thank you so much. All you residents, go out and do your best.